In our final segment, produced by Jacob Tate, we go behind locked doors at the Evansville Police Department to see where confiscated items and criminal evidence are held by the police. Hi, I'm Vince Robinson with the EVSC Community Link, here today with Sergeant Shroff of the EPD. How are you doing, sir? Good. So here in the evidence locker of the EPD, how many items do you see come in on a regular basis? Well, typically with the evidence room here, uh, we have anywhere from 10 to almost 20 items a day that may come in to the evidence room and uh, be cataloged in as evidence for a variety of reasons. What kind of items come into the evidence room? It could be anywhere from a found gun to uh, homicide evidence, whatever it may be. We end up being uh, kind of the repository, if you will, for anything that's collected involving a crime that has any evidentiary value, if you will. And so we house here all but narcotics evidence. Narcotics evidence is one of those items that is housed at a separate location for security reasons and, and various other components. What kind of system does the EPD use to inventory the evidence? We actually have a program, a uh, computer-based program, that is uh, a records management system. We call it RMS. And it has the ability not only for officers to take the initial reports, but to actually do an evidence voucher, as we call it, which means that they're submitting something on that case uh, as evidence. And once they do that, then they will uh, follow the procedure of entering that into evidence, and then our evidence custodian will take control of that item and actually do what we call a labeling system, a barcoding system, where that piece of evidence then is labeled and is able to be tracked, not only by the number, but by the barcode that's on it uh, so that we can locate it. So does everybody have access to the items that come in? So from the time the officer makes the initial run, collects whatever evidence he or she is gonna submit, they will then enter that into a storage, lock storage facility. The only one with keys to that storage locker system is our evidence custodian, who would then retrieve those items, usually the next business day, bring them into this area here, and actually go through the process of barcoding that item uh, to be located, as we talked about just a minute ago. And then they will be stored in this facility until they either go to trial until it may be a situation we get a court order to destroy evidence to get rid of it or it may be found property which means that someone has lost an item we're not able to make contact with them to retrieve that item so what we do is hold on to that for 90 days and after that period of time then that item is either destroyed or disposed of depending on on what we need to do how many items do you think are here right now you know that's a uh, probably a guesstimation without actually doing a, a computerized and a hand-picked inventory. But our best guesstimation is probably close to 100,000 items are present here in various uh, capacities as evidence or, or otherwise. And you have some of the stranger ones or older ones here, correct? Yeah, I, I kind of uh, took out some of our found property items that typically uh, kind of come in, some of those that may be a little more unique than others. Uh, some common day items as well that come in. Those all have uh, kind of unique features to them and you'll see that on some of these. Probably one that's most interesting here is, uh, and I'll just kind of hold it up to show you. On initial appearance, I think it looks pretty much like a pack of... Normal carton of cigarettes. Exactly. But if you actually take a closer look at it, it's actually uh, able to be activated in the capacity of what we would commonly call a taser. So it's a personal protection item. So when this is being housed here in our evidence area, not only is it behind the lock and key of the cages, but we also have a separate area for firearms. And this is considered to be a weapon, electronic control device, so we keep that in a separate area. Uh, a modified shotgun that is not legal by any stretch of the imagination for anyone to possess would be this here, uh, Mossberg shotgun. It looks like it's a, a 12 gauge. Homemade sling, sawed off barrel, as you can see, probably with a hacksaw, pretty rough cut, as well as a stock, pistol grip stock. In other words, it's been sawed down so that you can handle it with one hand. Uh, it can be very dangerous if it gets into the wrong hands. What is it about the shotgun that makes it illegal to have? The barrel is less than 18 and three quarters of an inch. 
So the length here, it was actually uh, consider it illegal. Um, and then also the pistol grip isn't such an issue, but uh, looking at the overall length, this gun is not basically made for hunting. Uh, it would be used for some sort of a assault weapon in that vicinity. So that's what makes it uh, primarily illegal is the fact of the barrel length. So not considering found items, but items that were taken in as part of a case. Mm -hmm. If a person was acquitted of a crime or it was decided they were not guilty in some way, would they get their items that were taken in back? Typically, that is what would happen. The courts would issue an order to us to say return such and such items to someone. Uh, we've had cases where someone has been convicted of a crime, however the property they had on them at the time was not theirs, and the courts would order then that to be returned to the rightful owner. So it may not be someone that was arrested or someone that was uh, not convicted, for example, but we found out who the rightful owner of the property was. We try to get it back to them, and we try to make sure that the court orders are issued in that fashion so that way we can have that as a, a record on hand. What part does the owner of an item have in reclaiming his item when it's been taken in? Well, first and foremost is uh, some fashion of identification. The best form of identification is a serial number or an owner applied number. The only way that we can enter property that is stolen into the national database, the National Crime Information Computer, NCIC, is by serial number make, model, those type of things. But having recorded your serial numbers, model numbers, all that kind of stuff is extremely important. It helps us, that's our way of tracking it back to you, if you will. And uh, also that means if, for example, something was stolen here in Evansville, and we've had this happen, we had a firearm that was stolen in Evansville 42 years ago. Last year, it was recovered in West Virginia. So we were able to get that weapon back because we had that serial number entered into the National Crime Information Computer. It stayed in the system and they confirmed the fact that it was still stolen. We said yes, we got it back and we were able then to proceed from there. The rightful owner of that weapon died, but we were able to get it back to the family. So it just shows the importance of it. We may not get it today or tomorrow. It may be an officer down in Florida that gets whatever item it is, but the only way we're gonna get it is by having that serial number recorded. Recently there was a case where somebody had stolen multiple items. Would all those come here and how would you deal with that? Yeah, we actually had a case uh, not all too long ago and it may have been seen on other uh, news stations that we recovered probably over 2,500 items. And by that I'm saying from uh, battery operated tools like would be used in construction throughout the gammon, you can only imagine. We had over 2,500 items that were stolen. And for us, we made every attempt to make contact with owners. We searched every serial number on every item. And very few items, probably less than 100, were actually able to be returned to owners because we had no stolen reports or we may have had stolen reports but no serial numbers to trace them back. So that just goes to show that someone in that case um, who had a lot of things that they stole from either burglaries, thefts, whatever it may be, we get into an investigation that leads to a huge recovery of property like that, but we're sitting with about 2,500 items that aren't claimed. And you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars probably worth of stuff or thereabouts. That's a guesstimation. But, so it's, it's extremely important, and that just goes to show that uh, how important it is not only to record it, but to report anything that's missing that you have, and uh, it aids us in getting it back to you. Thanks for letting us down here, Sergeant. It was real nice to get to learn about the uh, secret goings-on back here in the EPD. We appreciate the opportunity to share with you the, uh, the experience down here. Reporting from the Evansville Police Department's Evidence Locker for the EVSC Community Link, I'm Vince Robinson.